Step one, take a hammer to the bathroom scale. Step two, rip up all the diet rule books. And step three, get ready to redefine what health and well being means to you. And guess what? It's not your weight, it's not your shape, and it's not how much space you take up. Welcome to Body Kindness. I'm Rebecca Scritchfield. I'm the author of the book, Body Kindness, and host for this podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I ask that you keep an open mind as we have interesting conversations about what it means in this culture to resist and reject and divest from the norms of health is only for people who are pursuing thinness and weight loss and dieting. We can say no to that. That does not help many people create a better life. But through this show and our conversations, I am confident that you will find your own meaningful path to a happier and healthier life. Even if you want things to change, that's okay. But we have a whole lot of unlearning to do, and I invite you to join me on the unlearning. Going down, clown. Well, you just heard me having a scale smash party. That is actual audio from me smashing a stack of scales in front of a group of friends. And didn't it sound like a lot of fun? So if you want to learn more about how you can break up with the scale, and yes, I mean that attachment to the specific number, but I also mean the other scales that we use to measure ourselves. It could be attachment to certain ways of eating. It could be attachment to smaller clothes. It could be the fantasies we have in our minds about the way life should be right now, rather than thinking about how to be good to ourselves and make changes with a sense of self-compassion instead of shame. So free summer challenge all summer long, bodykindnessbook.com slash scale smash. And I'm going to help you out with some interesting reflective prompts and motivation and inspiration. And I really hope to see pictures and videos of you smashing your scale too. They're not actually concerned about my health. They're concerned about maintaining a value hierarchy that values thin people and devalues fat people. That was Marilyn Wan, a longtime fat activist, author of the book Fat So, and creator of the Yay Scale, which I'm excited to share. If you are interested in having Marilyn hack your scale and turn it from something negative into something positive and fun and actually exciting to be around, she is actually offering to do that for you. So you can email her, Marilyn at fatso.com. It's $45 plus shipping, and you can get all that information in the the show notes on my website. If you ever can't find something, you can always email me, Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining me on this journey as we've explored barriers to practicing body kindness. And I hope that what you realize in listening to these recent conversations that we often blame ourselves for getting in our own way. And while certainly as humans, behavior change is a process and we do make mistakes, we often often give ourselves more blame than we really deserve because there are simply cultural and societal factors that influences our thoughts, our beliefs, our opinions, and those types of things really get in the way of us achieving a better well-being. So I think you're going to get so many helpful pieces of advice from this conversation, no matter what size you are. I think if you're living in a larger body, this conversation is going to be very meaningful and helpful. But even if you're not, uh, you need to understand that we do all internalize this fear of uh, gaining weight, fat phobia, and weight stigma, and that uh, you can truly be an ally, that we really all need each other in finding this freedom to be who we are um, and 
define what self-care and well-being looks like for us within our abilities so that we can have a better, more joyful life. And then do me one favor before you finish listening to this show, please just click on over and leave a rating and review. It means a lot to me personally. It lets me know that I'm going in the right direction. And perhaps even more importantly, it allows others to find this helpful information as well. It can be very competitive and challenging and tricky um, because there's so much focus in the podcast world that says this about being body positive and kind and all this stuff. And it's really just weight loss in a different package. So we need to elevate these conversations that are truly supporting a healthy well-being. I thank you so much for listening and so, so much for your continued support. I hope you enjoy the show. My topic today is why we all need fat acceptance. And this topic is important to body kindness because no matter where you're at on the path of finding your caregiver voice and breaking free from diet culture and the oppressive belief that you have to change your body in order to be deemed healthy, one of the biggest barriers you'll face is fear. And the reality is we need to talk about where this fear comes from and how you can face it. And my hope is that this show will help you build more compassion for yourself and others. I hope that we all recognize that there's a common humanity and that we are all people and together we can really build a more compassionate, caring, and loving society. And my special guest to discuss this topic today is Marilyn Wan. Marilyn Wan is a longtime fat activist. She's author of the book, Fat So, and it's based on the 90s print zine of the same name. And she's also the creator of the Yay Scales. Welcome to the show, Marilyn. I'm so excited to have you here today. Thank you so much. I loved your intro. That was super fun. I'd really love to give a chance for you to share your background and what you're currently working on with listeners. So let's start there. What have you been working on lately? What have I been? I've been making some Yay Scales. They are, (laughs) (laughs) there. many people are familiar with a bathroom scale. And I think it's important to point out that humanity did not always have the technical ability to weigh ourselves and have a number about our weight. And I don't necessarily think that that ability is super vital. You know, human, human as a species, we survived for millennia, millions <laughs> of years without that. So not necessary, but I take bathroom scales and I liberate them from their oppressive use as some kind of arbiter of health and happiness. And I, instead of the numbers on the dial, I put in positive words about appearance. And then I treat the outsides with sparkliness and sometimes fake fur. And I send them out into the universe uh, for people who want to buy them. So they're all out there. And sometimes I use them myself in doing street activism. So I'll take, get a couple of friends together, take a A scale out onto a place where people are walking by, not in too much of a hurry and invite people to get a free compliment from the yay scale. So that's one thing that I've been doing recently. It's super fun. And it's a really key moment, I think, because a lot of us are trained in weight loss mentality and in thinner is better kind of thinking or worldview. And so stepping onto the scale is kind of a defining moment in both of those belief systems. I don't buy into those belief systems. And so I think when you step on a scale and it tells everybody that they're awesome in their own different way, that's radical. It goes to the root of a problem and it's revolutionary and that it can help us change our thinking about our worldview. And then Uh, It can be liberating, you know, just being freed from unnecessary and hurtful system. And and when I've done the street outreach many, many, many times, I've done it and just encountered so many different kinds of people who, like you say, are fearful about even stepping on the scale and then fearful that even when I say it's a compliment, they're sure that they're going to be the one who gets the negative word that must be hidden somewhere in there. (laughs) Or they're it's, sure a, they're, it's a trap. <laughs> exactly. Or they're sure they're going to break the scale. I mean, people of all sizes have exactly the same fears, which really helps me as a fat person in my own embodiment to know that it's not just me, right? Everybody is carrying around internalized weight oppression and living uncomfortably in relationship to it. Even people who I look at and think, well, they're a societally standard or ideal weight, they are carrying a lot of negativity and that that's doing them all sorts of harm in their lives, limiting them and, you know, physical and mental impacts. And so I've really been enjoying making A scales. They're hard to find online right now, but um, if people contact me by email or Facebook or whatever, they can find them. 
And for a really long time, I've been a fat activist and I've just, I've been doing that. I started doing that because I had a really bad day. Two things happened first. And this was back when I was in my mid twenties. First, I was having dinner with this guy that I liked. And in the middle of dinner, he said, I just realized I'm embarrassed to introduce you to some of my friends because you're fat. Oh, yeah. And it was pain- oh, hurtful. Gosh. Was yeah. Angry. You know, better to know, right? Because he certainly didn't deserve my company if he couldn't be wholly glad to be around me. Exactly. Right? Yeah. But I think I think a lot of us navigate dating and romance and relationships and feeling unworthy because of our weight. And that's just such a, a sad fact that is unnecessary too. So I went home, I opened the mail. And because I had been working as a freelance writer at the time, I didn't have health insurance. I had applied for individual coverage. And I opened the mail from Blue Cross and they said, thanks for applying. You're morbidly obese, so you're not allowed to buy health insurance at all. Um, And that double whammy of a social exclusion and an institutional exclusion made it really clear to me that it was absolutely not about me or my weight. And that the the weight based exclusions or discrimination or prejudice that that I was encountering were certainly not for my own good, right? Mm-hmm. So any time I've ever heard someone talk about so called obesity, um, mm-hmm. I don't believe that as a valid term. I don't think you can diagnose anyone based on what they weigh, what we weigh, right? So anytime I hear someone saying, "Oh, well, we have to cause everyone in the population to lose weight." Because health, right? I know that they aren't actually concerned about actual fat people's actual health. Because none of those people has ever said, I am really outraged that fat people don't have access to health insurance, that fat people are facing discrimination in health insurance. I'm outraged because fat people deserve access to preventive screenings like pap smears and flu shots and all of that kind of stuff, right? So they're not actually concerned about my health. They're concerned about maintaining a value hierarchy that values thin people and devalues fat people. And the very label obesity, when they're saying we've got to do something about this problem of obesity, that label is why I wasn't allowed to have health insurance most of my adult life until the Affordable Care Act came through. So that's a little bit of a detour into the kind of the health messaging stuff. But really what happened to me on that really bad day was that I became politicized. I decided that I was going to say no to a a worldview that valued people based on weight. And so the next day I started the zine uh, and it's fat exclamation point. So question mark. And I'm still asking that question. And I think it's still a really powerful question to ask. So what? So why do we make such a thing out of whether people are fat or thin or whatever people weigh. Um, I don't tend to say fat acceptance because I'm not actually asking people to accept me. I'm telling people to get out of my way. Mm, That's a good point. Because I find that I am, I mean, I'm a human, I make mistakes, but I find that I almost accidentally use them interchangeably. And I've always felt that that was wrong. Like fat acceptance is like, hey, just accept that I'm here and I'm present and I exist. And then fat activism is like, I reject what you're trying to say about me. So I feel like that is a stronger word. For sure. And I think it's possible because we're all trained to be negative toward fatness, right? To think negatively about fatness. I think there's a possibility when you say accept something that you accept it because you wish it could change, but you can't change it. So you accept it, right? Um. And that's absolutely not the vibe I feel at all. Even if I could flip a switch and be a thin person, I wouldn't because I believe in human diversity. So, and I I think that the goal for me in my really bad day was liberation. So I like fat lib or fat liberation, fat positivity at at the very least. And this is not a criticism of you. I mean, I, I, I realize that the whole community is kind of often called the fat acceptance community. And that's fine. I just wanted to mention, I think the emotional nugget, the core of what I wanted on that really bad day and what I've encountered with a lot of people is that we just want to get the good things in life. We want to go and live our lives and have the possibility for getting what everyone else has access to, right? You know, um, health, happiness, relationships, respect, uh, careers, endeavor, clothing, <laughs> you know, access to public accommodations like airplanes or theater seats or 
Mm-hmm. Salon chairs or cars or public transportation or medical equipment or, you know, access to respectful medical care that isn't only focused on our weight. So, you know, we've been sold this story, this lie that the only way to get the good things in life is to weigh a certain weight, right? Um, And so I think people imagine that fat activism or fat liberation or trying to change the world, (laughs) right, would take too long, right? It would take too long and it would never really happen, you know? And so they imagine that trying to change their bodies to fit the weight-based hierarchy, the weight-based value system would be faster and easier. When in fact, the reverse has actually been true in my experience. Mm. Can Um, you elaborate a little bit more on that? uh, Yeah, for sure. I would love to. If we imagine that you just lose weight and then you get all the good things in life, what we know from decades and decades of hundreds of thousands of people trying to lose weight is that nearly everyone loses weight and gains it back. A third to two thirds of the people who lose weight and gain it back will actually regain more weight than they lost. So if you say to someone, we'll just lose weight, that's actually not something that human bodies just do. That's not how we're built. And so that's a lie. (laughs) That's one level of the lie that's being sold. And then people temporarily lose weight, temporarily have access to what they think of as the good things in life or don't and feel betrayed. And then when the weight regain happens, which is something that happens to pretty much everyone, we're trained to blame individually, blame ourselves rather than blame the weight loss process, yes. the attempt to do something that uh, human bodies just don't do. If every time I bought a light bulb, like nine times out of 10, the light bulb didn't produce light, I don't think I would blame like my wrist, you know, for turning the <laughs> I think I would probably have the thought that it's possible to blame the light bulb or the makers of the light bulbs, right? Yeah. And if the light bulb people said, well, you're just doing it wrong because one time out of 10 or one time out of 100, it lights up and you should just keep buying our product over and over and over because you're the one who's not doing it right. I think I would question that, right? And any reasonable person would question the weight loss industry if it were not for the fact that there's crushing social pressure to be thin. And so, of course, we want people to like us. And so we keep buying a lie. We keep buying a lie knowing that it's a lie. We keep buying a kind of a vaguely repackaged lie, you know, thinking that, you know, this version of the lie will be different, (laughs) right? So if you think that it's faster and easier to get to the good life by losing weight, it's just not the case for pretty much everyone. And inevitably, even if you lose weight, even if you're in that honeymoon period, you are reinscribing in your person and to everyone around you, you're reinscribing that weight valuing system. I picture it as kind of like an infinite ladder with a rung for every pound and every inch and every clothing size and every belt notch. And that means that everyone, you and everyone around you is being re-exposed to this system of prejudice, really, you know? And so it's not fast or easier to lose weight and get to the good things in life that way. And I totally want the good things in life for everyone, people of all sizes. I don't have any resentment against thin people. I don't want to take anything away from them, right? So on the other side, is it faster and easier to change the world? Yeah, actually, because you can immediately start changing your own viewpoint, your own thinking. It's not permanent. It's like it's not total, right? Like I don't just flip a switch and be fat and happy and have no problems inside or in my life, right? But I can stop buying that lie and reinforcing it on myself. And that's a huge relief to know that you yourself are on your own side. Like I am on my side, this fat body, me, myself, my embodiment, um, we're on the same team. And um, anyone who treats me badly because of my weight then gets opposition from me. So the world still has a lot of weight bigotry and fat discrimination out there. And we're all going to encounter it. But the pushback that I've seen since I started as a fat activist and what what was happening before I started, you know, it really started in the late 60s, has really changed the world already. And it keeps changing the world. And I don't want to kind of promise a perfect, happy life from doing fat liberation. But it's certainly a faster and easier way to a much to a much better experience in my in my life. And from what I've seen with other people than any other method. So there's the personal level of how we feel about ourselves. There's the social interaction level of how people in our world treat us. 
And by coming out as a fat person, I was able to learn that actually most of my friends and family actually liked me for how I was. They weren't as negative about my weight as I thought they were. And the people who were negative about my weight, you know, if our relationships declined and drifted away, I didn't actually miss them. I didn't end up being alone. I ended up having more friends, more social connection and more genuine connection to people that actually did me good by being out as a fat person. And uh, I think it's hard to navigate the workplace or to navigate kind of institutional interactions. And I think we're all still trying to figure out how to challenge weight hierarchy in those places and still take care of ourselves so that we don't have to pay a huge price. But it's certainly possible. And I think fat community creates resources for doing that. And the work that you're doing, for example, in a field that has done terrible amounts of reinforcing weight hierarchy, you know, you and so many other dietitians, nutritionists, exercise professionals are challenging those belief systems. And so um, we all can support each other through community. So the short version is by coming out as a fat person, by coming out as being the body I am currently, not some future fantasy thinner body, um, I didn't have to wait to live my life. I could start living it right now. So it is actually faster, easier, even when I face opposition, even when I face negativity. It's not opposition and negativity that I carry inside me. Girl, I got like 72,000 questions. <laughs> but already I feel like I could hit stop record and just put it out there in the world and you already you'd be helping so many people. So I'm so, so grateful. So I'm going to try to delve a little bit deeper and try to make some connections. So it sounds like one of the things, you know, because when I when I queued up this episode and I appreciate the call out because the, the original title, I might have to adjust it, but it's yeah. why we why why we all need fat acceptance. And you made an excellent case for really that this is about fat activism. So one of the things I'm going to table it now, but one of the things I'd like to talk about is maybe like, what is our perception of what it means to be a fat activist? Mm. And so how we can figure out how we can align in that direction. But it sounds like when you're talking about your personal liberation moment, that, you know, and kind of this connection for like, like why we all need each other basically. Cause that's, that's my view is it's like, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're going, you know, if you want to change, get rid of diet culture, if you want to help your kids feel confident in their bodies, or you want to help prevent, you know, weight-based bullying, you know, like we all have something that we care about, but it's this idea that we're going to get these things that we want for ourselves as an individual or our family or community by working together and, Part of that means that we might need to be in two different places and and figuring out how, like me, I know I'm always looking to learn and grow. But really what you're saying in your opening story is that we're all suffering for the same reasons. It's just we might be in different sized bodies. And certainly people in large bodies have an outward oppression, like workplace discrimination, external sources of weight-based discrimination, like you mentioned with health insurance. But when you look at the number of like 80% of women struggle with their body image, we're yeah. not born with that. That's culturally right. driven, misogynistic, anti-feminist. It also comes from racism, mm -hmm. classism, ableism, homophobia, can you elaborate on that a little bit more for listeners? Sure, I think that would sure. Be good. As, I mean, as I'm learning also, I haven't been as aware as I wish I had been, but fat activism started out mainly as a thing that, you know, middle class, upper middle class, white, fat women, mostly straight, um, but also some lesbians did. And that misses out on a really huge connection that all of these kinds of prejudice um, work together, amplify each other. If someone is racist, they're likely also homophobic and misogynistic and fat hating. And, the, you know, we've seen that in terrible ways in our world recently. And so if I'm doing fat activism without connecting to anti-racism, I'm just missing what's really going on. And I think if you look at the history of weight-based prejudice, it comes from negative attitudes toward people of color, toward immigrants, toward poor people, toward women toward disabled people. So I think an intersectional approach is 
at the basis of what we have to do. And we have to uh, really question who we mean when we say we, right? And it's all of us with all of our identities and often a mix of identities that is super important. So I think it can be scary to kind of try to show up for people when you don't have the same experience that they do um, or make make room for leadership and, and uh, welcome voices and um, center the experiences of people who aren't exactly the same as us. But that's the only way we really get to what's really going on. Right. I'm so grateful that you brought up intersectionality. And I can say that if we take it back to say back when I was, because before dietetics, I was like a aerobics instructor or whatever, you know, but like I was like 18 years old. So over 20 years, I've been in the diet culture model. You know, it was so looking in hindsight, it was all parents focused, but this is healthy. This is good longevity, you know, and it wasn't until through, so I've been a a member of association of for size diversity and health since probably about 2007 or 2008, I'd have to look for sure. But it it wasn't even until a few years into my membership there. So maybe even just three years ago, maybe, where I started hearing intersectionality. Yeah. I mean, people have been doing that work. You know, the, the pioneers of that kind of thinking are uh, often, you know, Black queer women. So it, it's not new, but I think that it's definitely a powerful awareness that we can all really benefit from. And I think especially because I come from a a white, you know, experience, I have a lot to unlearn and a lot to kind of show up for and try to speak to other, you know, when I'm talking to other white people, definitely say, you know, here's this huge problem that doesn't necessarily directly affect us. And so we think we're fine, but we're not, we're really all operating and reinforcing hierarchies and prejudices that that I think we really could do better to un, to dismantle, yeah, uh, to divest from. It can easily feel overwhelming, or I don't understand. You know, it's something. It's a learning and growing opportunity, and and I'm always reinforcing. What do you know now? What is your next best step? But, you know, I think kind of taking it back to the square one, that if you identify as someone who struggles with body image, whether it's, gosh, I hate diets are so stressful. I'm so sick of them, but I struggle with my body or my appearance, or I can't get away from the messages. Even the awareness of knowing that you struggle with that because of all these forces out Mm -hmm. of your control that you did not ask for. I would say the intersectionality piece, correct me if I'm wrong, but it would be that so women have certain oppressions, but a fat woman would have an oppression and a fat black woman would have an additional oppression on it. Is that accurate? Yes, for sure. And I don't think they just add up like one plus one plus one. I Mm -hmm. think they magnify each other. Like Uh, whatever that sign curve, I don't even know anymore. Exponential. That's it. Thanks. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) So I think that if you're bought into, if you're trying to to get rid of negative weight messages in your head, they're all attached to negative race messages, negative class messages, negative messages about um, whether someone has a disability or not. And so addressing those actually helps um, free us from from the things that affect us directly and the fact, things that affect us indirectly. It means that we can have genuine relationships in our lives rather than falling into patterns that are really um, destructive, right? I think in our culture at large, this is a huge moment to choose either between tribalism or compassion. And I would prefer the latter for myself and for everybody around me. So it's just a really great way to connect with our own bodies and with other people. Yeah. And I think that that is the key point is no matter where you're at is understanding that there are things that impact how you feel right now that you might not even be aware of how it came to be. But I guess to use the word acceptance, accept that there are all these forces and accept that there are many ways of addressing those forces. Mm -hmm. And, and you as an individual, as one person taking 
any logical step away from diet culture, away from body oppression, like, like your yay scales, take a hammer (laughs) to your scale, right? You know, pick up the pieces and then get a yay scale instead and to get a positive reinforcement. I'm happy to tell people how to hack their own scales and liberate them. (laughs) I think, I think one piece that really helps me attach as an activist and Mm -hmm. not feel afraid about um, the messages that are coming at me all the time, because they certainly come at me about weight and not being valuable if you're fat, being more valuable if you're thin. What I would encourage people to do is to notice, to really notice when that's happening. And instead of buying those lies, notice that that's a system, a hierarchy system, a valuing system that's being imposed and get angry about it because it's a hurtful thing to say, oh, this person over here is less valuable. This person over here is more valuable for no reason. Other than that's just the way our system, our culture values people. Um, So notice when, you know, if you see a diet ad on TV, notice that it is reinforcing hierarchy and tap into your own anger and disagreement with that hierarchy. So just um, for me as an activist, I know activism can sound like too much work, but really what I'm doing most of the time is noticing an injustice, noticing something hurtful, feeling angry about it, being willing to feel angry about it and disagree, and then finding my own way to respond. And it's not always a sign on a street corner with like screaming. <laughs> it's, it's very rarely that. Sometimes it's a yay scale. Sometimes it's connecting with a community of other resistors um, and commiserating. Sometimes it's having a pool party, right? So I think um, if we broaden the definition of activism to what it really is, which is changing the world, then every time we, we um, refuse to buy the lie about um, our value being defined by what we weigh, and we get angry about that, and we do something to change the world about it, that's activism, and it's liberating, and um, I hope it can connect to all the other liberation movements. Thank you for doing that, because like I hear that, and it's like, wow, the fear I had about saying, I'm a fat activist, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of dissipated. Mm, Just, oh, good. you know, I mean, pool party, that sounds awesome. <laughs> but I do love that because first of all, I love the word angry. I love, I love just as a female having the right to get angry. Like I love, I love the idea of just permission to get angry and upset about something. And I like the idea of that, you know, so you get angry, you, s- and it's using your voice, right? You state your disagreement and then you take action. You respond with something meaningful to you in that moment and doable. And I'm thinking, and this literally serendipity, I guess, five minutes before we got on our chat today, I was on Facebook and uh, saw this article that was in very recently in the New York Times about fat bias starts early and takes a serious toll. Mm -hmm. And I, as a mom of two young kids myself, and, and realizing that a big way that you change culture is focusing on your future generation. So there's a lot of new work that I'm doing that is focused, whether it's in private practice on kids and families and making sure that at least in in my area, doctors have a person who's not going to cause more harm to refer to, to help to deal with, you know, concerns. And just in my own interest, you know, this is, this is an area that I care deep, deeply about. Well, I was able to read the story enough to know that there was a recent research study and pull this quote about from the researcher. Uh, she chased, traced the origins of weight bias in young children and adolescents to the families they grow up in, as well as society at large, which continues to project cultural ideals of ultra slim- slimness and blames people for being fat. And I was getting blood boiling, reading the article, like, but half excitement because I'm like, oh, I get to get angry again. (laughs) And so I, it was a quick, I went to Facebook, I pulled that quote and I just added, you know, not cool. This upsets me. And people in large bodies are people. They deserve respect. We must work on ourselves and teach our kids that fat is not bad, that people aren't bad. Otherwise, we're prone to screw them up. And I know we don't want to do that. And and then I linked to it. And so it was like, I feel like by your definition, that was some fat activism. Get angry, disagree and respond. It took me two seconds. Right. But and also it's wonderful that in our world already that researcher can publish that research that it can be in The New York Times. Mm. That's a huge change from when I first started as an activist. 
So yeah, things yeah. are changing. Things are always changing. Things have not always been this way. They're not always going to be this way. And I think there's something really satisfying about being one of the early adopters, mm-hmm. the early uh, pioneers. Reps. Rebels, pioneers, Ooh, and it's still. I like rebel. Days. We'll go with rebel. rebel for <laughs> sure, for sure. It's really still early days, so everyone can jump on. There's more than enough bad guy out mm-hmm. there to to target and to and to oppose, and we mm-hmm. each have a precious way of leveraging our voice against that oppressive force. So we need everybody's voice and everybody's action. And also self-care is part of activism. So Mm -hmm. simply leaving an oppressive situation is activism, taking care of yourself, showing that example to other people. Like I don't have to watch Biggest Loser. I never have. I'm never going to. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, I um, I can be an activist by where I um, look away from what I avoid, what I take myself out of. And it's Mm -hmm. painful that our families are often a source of weight valuing. I was interested to hear that you were, that you, it sounded like you were expecting family or friends to be more judgmental when you found your liberation, but you were surprised they weren't. <laughs> there, were, there were some holdouts, of course. Okay. But. Okay. <laughs> There's always a few stragglers. Family is really hard because they're family and, you know, they may not change their views. Um, I know a lot of people in fat community who end up saying, you know, they just draw a healthy boundary, which can be difficult to do. But um, we each know how to how best to communicate in our families if we can, you know, just to say, you know, I don't want to hear about my weight or my eating or my health. You don't need to talk to me about that. If you talk to me about that, it makes me feel like I don't want to be around you. That just the way it rolled off your tongue. It sounded. Yeah, I'll remove myself, even if it's Thanksgiving, not mm-hmm. sitting at the table if people are harshing on me. Mm-hmm. Right. And that can be really powerful. And, and, and walking away does make a statement, right. Of like, of this is, because a lot of times it's like, oh, I don't want to upset so-and-so or I need to, you know, mm-hmm. and it's that constant mm-hmm. giving that harms your well-being. And if the best thing for your well-being is to just get out of maybe a heated emotional situation and walk away, you yourself get to take a few calm, deep breaths, kind of let your emotions regulate and think calmly and rationally about when you do speak to the situation again, you know, assuming it's family and you're not going to write them off completely, you know, mm-hmm. that, that you might have some thoughts about what you could do, but it also communicates to the other person like, wow, I really care about her and she's angry, you know, or I hurt her. And, and, and that's important for them to see that. Right. Right. I mean, I think that people want to avoid conflict, but keep in mind that we didn't start it. Right. And it may very well be that the person who's repeating or or saying some kind of anti-fat or weight judging statement, that they're repeating something they've heard, that they've internalized, that they're suffering from. But but they're kind of starting that situation, you know, on their own. Like they choose to tell you you should lose weight or you shouldn't eat whatever thing. So I think we can respond to conflict without having to feel fearful about it. And we can show up for ourselves and as an, in an activist capacity for everyone who comes after us in a situation, right? You know, every time I say in a medical setting, oh, I don't step on the scale. That's not related to my health. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're educating one nurse at a time. (laughs) Right. I wonder if that intake person or that office will feel less entitled to have that be a kind of a a barrier at the door. So yeah, Yeah. anger and activism are not, they don't have to look angry. They don't have to look like what we think of as activism to be really highly effective. Right. I think that's a really important point, you know, just to be clear. And it's one step at a time. Like, what could you do in this particular moment? You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to put the scale away. I'm going to take a hammer to it. You know what? I'm finally going to get rid of those clothes that I haven't worn in years that just don't fit. You know, I'm going to get some that do. And, and that alone, I, you know, my privilege is I can walk into any store and find something. And not everybody has that privilege. So there might be a lot of difficulty and pain associated with taking that action. But the the liberation, there's liberation to follow. And so it's like, it's like these, I think the immediate action thing is really important because the more you are able to do for yourself and like how you got this view that life is better, like you said, life can be better right away by that next choice. 
that then you can decide, well, where do I want to go with this next? Or what am I willing to do next? Maybe I'll set that boundary at the family holiday, or maybe I'll, I just have to accept that this person that I really want to be a friend is just too painful to be around them. So they're an acquaintance and I'll go find some other friends. Yeah. And I do just really want to acknowledge that, you know, we all face constraints and scarcity. You know, not everybody Mm -hmm. has enough money to just go buy a new pair of pants. True. Um, not everybody has the life situation where they can just say, well, that person, you know, they may rely on someone who's being negative toward them. Mm -hmm. But I also think that we can try to find ways to navigate that, that don't repeat the weight depression that we're trying, that is already damaging us. And we know that it's physically harmful as well as psychologically harmful. Uh, I was just reading a study that just came out today or recently Mm -hmm about how people who happen to have diabetes do better if they have self-compassion. I need to see that. Yeah, it's great, right? And Mm -hmm. uh, so every time a fat person is diagnosed with diabetes, the first things that they're likely to hear are blaming their weight and shaming them for their weight and telling them that they can't be healthy unless they change their weight. Well, that's just a setup for failure. And it's a setup for failure, not only because we know that weight loss is not a long-term option, feasible, but also because it's under, it's eroding their self-compassion, which in itself is something that allows people to do the best for them, for ourselves, right? Like a classic line in fat liberation and health at every size is, we take the best care of the things that we love. So if you love your body, if you love your life now, not a certain number of pounds away, then you take really good care of yourself. And there's no telling whether a lot of the so-called health problems related to weight are actually health problems related to fat oppression, to repeated attempts at conforming to a thin ideal. I don't think we completely know all of that. But um, I do know that other groups that have health problems are not vilified for them. For example, cisgender men have higher rates of certain illnesses, and they're not told that they should not be men. <laughs> right? <laughs> so our, our reaction to fat people is steeped in anti-fat bigotry. And that really, really flourishes in medical settings. And we can all um, push back against, you know, anywhere you come upon it, push back against it, because then that's more livable space for everybody, including ourselves. Yeah. And that is why we do all need each other and everything like that, because it's, it's Desmond Tutu, one of my favorite quotes, my humanity is bound in yours, for we can only be human together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And I really want to acknowledge the activists and health at every, every size pioneers who came before me. They were doing work for decades before I came along. None of this stuff is original to me. You know, I'm really grateful and I'm especially excited for all of the people of color and queer people and gender queer people and people with disabilities who are coming along and really challenging fat activism in really important directions and bringing their voices and vision for what our world could look like, because I need them. We all need all of us, just like you said. Yeah. I think that's an important point. No matter what you do, everyone has a purpose or something that they can do that's going to help. It's like removing the brick from diet culture. And I think it was Jess Baker who was on my podcast who said, well, you can't dismantle diet culture without working on fat liberation. And so I thought that was really powerful as well. Like they're intertwined. I wanted to ask you about something which I 100% agree with self-compassion and talking about we take the best care of the things we love. So I guess I'll just kind of see what you think about, you know, like one of the things I explain to really anyone who asks, but it could be a helping professional. It could be someone who's reading body, body kindness and trying to work on it of that. Of course, people will still come with a weight concern or a desire to lose weight. And the first thing I say was, is that, well, that makes sense because they're a product of the diet cultures. I'm not saying, oh, no, no, no. In order to take one step, you need to be fully ready to just, mm-hmm. you know, nothing that to make space for how you're feeling right now. But that where I draw the line is that it's an issue of giving up the idea that you control your weight, that that is something that you could say, well, if I just do this, then that will happen. And if I don't do this, then that will happen. And that's what I try to help people say. And and I'm very careful not to sort of sell, oh, come on, just let's balance this plate and da, da, da. And you will lose weight or you might lose weight. Like even like that glimmer of that might, like I want to just be like, look, I want you to 
make space for this desire, right? As a product of diet culture that you're saying that right now in this moment that you're hoping that these habit changes that, that really do, you know, improving your sleep or like you said, better self-care that Mm -hmm. like you can, I don't know, some clients are like, can I admit this to you? And I'm like, well, yeah, because it, it makes sense. But my point is I'm not going to engage in work with you or in work that gives this glimmer of hope that with a certain behavior, your body would respond in a certain way, typically with weight loss, right? And that if it did, that you're not a better person. And so I guess why is what- that even, Why is that even desirable? Why do we have to have that hook of that thought in our heads? That was training. That wasn't- that Oh, isn't I agree. Science. It isn't um, truth. It isn't necessary. If I think about self-compassion, it doesn't have any prereqs. It doesn't have any pre-requirements. And I, I realize that there's a danger in talking about health at all, that it makes it sound like people are supposed to be healthy and anyone who's not healthy is um, doing something wrong. And just the same way that I don't think we control who are, what our bodies are. I don't think we control whether we're healthy or not. And we're all going to face illness, injury. We're all going to die at some point. And what if when we faced all of those tough moments, we had self-compassion, which would be like, you know, the moment is tough, but I don't have to be tough on myself, right? I'm who I am. And that's a good thing. So I sometimes say, if fat people aren't welcome to exist in society, there's no point in talking about our health. Because I think a lot of the public health messaging is really um, wrapped up in a kind of eugenics, right? Like we want a society with only thin people or only white people or only able-bodied people or only straight people. I mean, it's really ugly in, in, in a, in a pretty basic way. Yeah. Um, so instead I would, I would rather say we are who we are and we're not always going to be healthy. We're not always going to be whatever seems to be the pressure, the social pressure to be. And I actually would rather celebrate our identities as we are. Yeah. You bring up a really good point. It's something that I've been struggling with and, and I've had on my to-do list maybe for the last month or so, which is like, you know, I actually need to, I think that the word health is just basically ruined in our culture anyway, because it's aligned with diet, you know, it's, it's, and it's wrong. And so I feel like I need to actually sit down and write on a piece of paper, like what's my definition of health, you know, because I feel like being a registered dietitian nutritionist, being an exercise physiologist is just like, I don't feel like I can shake the idea of health, although through and through with body kindness and what I put out there, I try to, the word I like is well-being and compromise and compose and well-being is physical and mental. And then I chain it to, and if you care about mental, you can't be oppressive of your body or anybody else's. And so I feel like I have like ideas for a reframe for health, but I don't have it written or is clear in my own mind and then, and then out there so that, you know, people they're seeing, okay, this is what in my view is what health looks like because it is, it's wrapped up into appearance. And like you said, it's wrapped up in the idea. I mean, even using the word obesity, you know, it's wrapped up in the idea that that, like you were saying earlier, that it could even be linked to being the cause of certain diseases. That's not even accurate. The different factors outside of genetics, socioeconomic, and all these other factors that that could influence somebody's state of health or well-being. Well, I think um, what I was trying to get at earlier is that social justice is, for me, a big part of health. I think if we look at the social determinants of health, and um, I don't think anyone's required to pursue health. So, for example, I think health becomes code for um, how to get respect and how to be a person in our society. And I'd like to question that expectation. So I I think your term body kindness is actually really lovely, both for the social justice part and how we can re-envision all the ways that people want to live in our bodies, given everything that we face. Yeah, it is so important. And, you know, there are some very, very, I could go at every level in my life, but like whether it's acquaintances, professionals, people I admire, and very close friends and very close family members and, you know, who had suffered at the hands of weight stigma. And for me, it like cuts like a knife when I 
experience fat oppression, right? Because it's like, that's my person that I care about very deeply that that you're hurting. And I do think that that is something that can, you know, a lot of times people will say, oh, it, it's so hard for me, but I can see this, you know, I could see this for other people to find an emotional connection and a sense of worthiness too, right? That you, that you deserve more and that life can be better. Fear is going to be there. There's always fear of the unknown, but that to try to take action in a way that you truly feel like makes your life better. And as you said, there are, there are pioneers who have been doing this work for a while. There's people like you. There are, and hope to see more books coming out and podcasts and all these things where we can just open up our minds and, and take in some of that goodness to, to, to counter the very strong, pervasive, political, economical, forces that hold up diet culture. You remind me of, I know we're winding down on our time, but you remind me of a, a statement I come across often, which is someone who says, well, I guess it's okay to be fat as long as you're healthy. Um, Boo. <laughs> first, I don't actually need anyone's permission yeah. to be a fat person. Mm -hmm. Second, no, actually, it's just okay to be fat. It's okay to be your body. And if you are facing a health concern, um, the last thing anyone needs is judgment or shame or blame. That's just going to make it worse. So it's not actually a kind or helpful thing to say as long as you're healthy, um, because that reinforces the idea that healthy people are OK and unhealthy people did something wrong and are valued less. We're all going to face stuff in our lives and we're all going to be different sizes and heights and colors and identities and that should be valued. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And I think that, I think we accomplished our goal of the chat within the first two minutes, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> if you get nothing else out of the conversation, it's this understanding that, you know, you've listened for this whole time is there's something we've been talking about that speaks to you and to follow that and just take the next most important step. And it's going to revolve around letting yourself get upset that you didn't ask for whatever oppressions you're dealing with. You didn't ask for it. You didn't create it, but acknowledging that it's there and then using your voice to say, basically, this shit ain't right, you know, <laughs> and then take an action that matters to you that you think helps give you a better life. And as you get the benefits of this, I would nudge you to look at ways where, you know, it's not necessarily about helping others, right? Because they're going to help themselves, but in the way that you treat other people, in the way that you stand up for the rights of others. You know, we, we didn't get into allyship literally here in this conversation, but I think I think you would say that everybody could be an ally. Well, everybody has a stake mm -hmm. in liberating all of us. Yeah. Well, on that note, I have lots of links that I would love to share with folks. And is there kind of one main place where people can connect with you or stay in touch? Because um, I'm sure they, they loved everything that they've heard today. Thank you so much. I'm on Facebook as Marilyn Juan, and I do a lot on Facebook still. Mm -hmm. There's a FATSO website, FATSO.com, and there's also a MarilynJuan.com website. So people can find me also just by, you know, an internet search. And I welcome, I'm just always happy to mm -hmm. hear from people. Well, I have this vision of my daughters in my head as I, I know you've never met them or anything like <laughs> that, but I believe that when you had your I'm just going to say no to this fat liberation moment that that moment had an impact on me, whether or not I can make direct links. And that is going to have an impact on how my daughters relate to the world. So I appreciate everything you've ever done to help people be at peace and to create peace in the world. Wow. Thank you. And to you too. And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners. Please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash body kindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook. 
search Body Kindness and request to join the group for Body Kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com.